Hello, and today in this video, which has been sponsored by ExpressVPN, but more of that later, I am going to talk on the topic of gladiators. Yes, now, um, you know at this point something that I don't. You know how long this video is. I dare say even before you clicked on it you saw a little number in the corner of your screen. But as I'm speaking now I have no idea how long this is going to be. No, I have some idea. I think this one's going to be pretty long. So hold on to your hat. So gladiator, what does the word mean? Well, uh, it's pretty clear really. Um, as you'd imagine it means an unrepentant cannibal. Oh, no, wait a minute, that was a joke. Um, no, gladius is uh, Latin for sword, and so a gladiator would be a man who uses a sword. So swordsman is a very accurate and straightforward definition of the word gladiator. But there's more to it than that, isn't it? Uh, because we know gladiators as people who fought uh, for the entertainment of the masses. Actually, that's not all they fought for. There was a ritual element to it, and sometimes they fought in front of quite small numbers of people. But yes, it's someone who for, for ritual and or entertainment reasons is, is fighting, um, is showing a display of martial skill so that witnesses can, can um, appreciate that display for itself. It's not actually to any military purpose. Now, uh, gladiators fought for about a thousand years. So if gladiating, which is now a verb because I've just used it as one. Um, if gladiating were a really stupid idea, uh, then it probably wouldn't have lasted a thousand years, would it? I mean, not if all those people uh, knew about it and, and lives depended on it. Although that said, it's not exactly proof that it wasn't a stupid idea either, because a lot of very stupid ideas that lives did depend on, like, oh, I don't know, the four humours in medicine, or um, the fact that flies have four legs, or the whole of astrology. Yeah, there were some very stupid ideas that did hang around for a very long time. So the fact that gladiating lasted for... Uh, gladiation, there's another word, um, lasted for a thousand years, um, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it was a good idea. Now, there's quite a, a long, thin tail end there. The, the, the height of, uh, of gladiation was the first first and second centuries AD. That was when the, the huge gladiatorial um, event took place and, um, and, and of course most gladiators died and a lot of gladiators. At the height something like 8,000 people were dying in the arena every year. So how can we explain that vast amount of carnage? Well that's what this video is about. Now the ancients disagree as to how uh, gladiation got started. Um, when I was doing my uh, degree in archaeology, I remember being taught that uh, uh, gladiatorial fighting started with the Etruscans in the region known as Etruria. It, and I'd love to be able to show you a simple map of Etruria. Um, it's, so, it's north of Rome. It's sort of here, but at other times it included this bit and, and, and this bit. And, but anyway, um, uh, it, it, was, it was a confederation of cities, so putting a border around an area doesn't really make much sense. Um, but anyway, so there's Etruria roughly. And south of it is Campania, which is a rival location for the origin of uh, the gladiatorial games. And in between you can see uh, where Rome was in, in the Latin region. So, um, but that's a gross simplification by the way, there was an awful lot of overlap and changes over time, but there you go, I'm trying to keep it simple. Um, so the Etruscans had funeral rites, it seems, when gladiators would fight, uh, perhaps to the death, uh, at somebody's funeral. So why would you do that? Well, I suggest that the reason is it's 100% proof that you are really high status. Think about it. That is something which can only happen at a small number of funerals. If every time some guy died, a load of other guys had to die as well, then after a few generations there wouldn't be any men left. You'd have a population entirely of women, and where's the fun in that? Um, so I don't think uh, that uh, it would be possible to extend this privilege to more than a tiny minority. Therefore, since everyone would know this because they're not daft, they would know that it's a hundred percent proof that you must be a person of tremendous significance if other men fight to the death at your funeral. And of course your living relatives will be able to prove that they are part of a very very important dynasty. They'll be able, they'll be showing the world this. Now of course that's not the way they would voice it. They would say, oh no, it's a ritual. It, it's a it's to the fighting to the memory of the departed and it's something to do with gods or whatever. But yeah, you're proving your really high status if you have gladiatorial games um, or fights, duels at your, uh, the funeral of one of yours. So uh, that's where possibly it started and that's where I was taught it was started. But the physical evidence uh, for uh, the, the early gladiators is mainly uh, down south in Campania. Uh, Campania. Um, 
And uh, a lot of people point to the amount of art, the frescoes, uh, the, the mosaics and the, the, the mouldings on bits of, uh, of pottery and so forth, sometimes on quite ordinary domestic items like lamps, but also not just low art, really high art as well, uh, very, very good wall, pa wall paintings, murals uh, and frescoes and carvings of the highest quality. So people at all strata of society got interested uh, in gladiators and what they represented. It seems they represented more than just a couple of blokes having a scrap. There was something noble in it. They, these, these gladiators were demonstrating some noble human virtue, some bravery, masculinity, whatever it was. Um, uh, sacrifice perhaps. Um, there was something that they were showing the world that was of, of uh, religious and ritual significance beyond just, like I say, uh, blokes stabbing each other. Now, uh, I would say that uh, one of the best pieces of argument for Campania being the origin of uh, gladiation is uh, the fact that in 73 BC, a significant date, um, in 73 BC, uh, within a 35 mile radius of Capua, which was the biggest city uh, in that region and the second biggest in, in the whole of Italy, there were 12 arenas for gladiatorial combat. Whereas in the whole of the rest of Italy combined, there were two. So yeah, Campania really was the hub. And that was where a guy in 73 BC called Spartacus, you might have heard of him, uh, broke out of a certain training camp and uh, then with just 75 of his gladiator mates uh, went up to the top of uh, Mount Vesuvius, camped there for a bit, and a load of the local, uh, like the equivalent of the National Guard. Um, when the Roman uh, uh, the Senate decided that they had better send out a force to deal with these, uh, they didn't really send their A team. Um, so there was a load of uh, the equivalent of the National Guard, if you like, part-time soldiers, uh, and not all that many of them, and they were very overconfident. And um, yes, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the 75 uh, gladiators on Mount Vesuvius uh, came down on ropes, and uh, I think the, the American phrase is, handed the Romans' asses to them. Uh, so that was very embarrassing. But uh, though a lot of people think of it, it was a gladiator, a gladiator revolt, it was actually really a slave revolt. Uh, technically, gladiators were all slaves. Um, and as these gladiators went around the country, they were encountering more and more slaves and freeing more and more slaves. And about one in six of the slaves they met joined them. And so uh, after a while, they had uh, an army of tens of thousands in it uh, to take on the, the Romans. Um, and they were almost all completely ordinary slaves, not gladiators, but just any slave who wanted to fight for freedom. Uh, it's on a bit of a hiding to nothing. Uh, I think he made a, possibly a tactical error in this is a bit of an aside, but it made possibly in a tactical error by they killed all slave owners that they came across, no matter how gentle uh, they were, no matter what, how, of what political persuasion or possible political usefulness they would have had. They just killed them all. And I think that was that was really uh, uh, that was really a mistake um, because that just completely justified the Romans in doing whatever they needed to do to stop this rebellion and put it down. The Romans uh, didn't feel that they would have to reform anything, change any laws, treat. Um, slaves any differently because if they behaved so barbarically in such an obvious wrong way that they, they were completely justified in just stamping them out. So I think maybe that was a, a strategic error on the part of um, Spartacus, Crixus and all the rest. Anyway, that happened in 73 BC um, and significantly uh, in 70 BC, just to, just a couple of years later, um, that was the first ever amphitheatre, you know, the big stone amphitheatre purpose built for gladiatorial games was built in Pompeii, which is in Campania, so uh, not very far away. Now, uh, the early uh, gladiatorial games happened near tombs and would have been witnessed by just the people who needed to know, uh, the various families involved uh, in, in, the, in the funeral and other people would perhaps get to know. It wasn't a mass spectacle at that stage. Um, Livy says that uh, the Romans got into gladi gladiatorial games sometime around the time of the First Punic War. Um, and uh, it, it, so the Romans themselves were actually coming to this later, um, and it do, it doesn't immediately take on this this guise of the, the huge uh, auditorium with vast cheering crowds. Instead, there would be perhaps an execution or something happening in a marketplace, and they would uh, have some gladiatorial fights uh, associated with that. 
uh, and then they would think, well, maybe we'll set up some temporary wooden structures, some benches or whatever, so that people can, can watch. And even though we can't, we're not supposed to charge for, to watch the actual thing, that maybe we could charge for the use of the, of, of, the, of the benches, of the raised seating, but then that would mean that only the people on the raised seating really get to see and the common people don't. And some people thought that that was wrong. Everyone should be able to see this execution. So um, there was a conflict of interest there. And after a while, people thought, well, maybe we, should have, we, should, we want purpose-built uh, arenas for this to happen in and the first ones went up the first permanent ones were, were wooden however so we don't have any of them none of those have survived and um, uh, who would have been invited to these early gladiatorial games well one of the reasons you put on gladiatorial games is to bribe people um, but you don't have to actually bribe all the masses. You can just bring along the people who count. So in the early days, it would be tribunes, people's tribunes, people like that, people with really important votes. You get those uh, bribed by putting on a good show for them or promising them a good show, and that would often do the job. You didn't have to necessarily win over the whole mob. Um, but Julius Caesar, who came later, he saw the potential for winning over the whole mob, and not uniquely, there were others into it as well. There's one way, one reason you put on the games is to win the favour of the crowds or the, the key voters. And if you wanted to get ahead in politics, in Roman politics, putting on uh, some games was a very good uh, forward step. Now, uh, the, uh, the wooden one in uh, Rome burnt down in 64 AD and got replaced by this building. You know what this building is? Don't you? Of course you recognise it. Yes, this is the Amphitheatre of Flavius, or the Flavian Amphitheatre. What's that? The, the Colosseum. No, this is not the Colosseum. This is the Flavian Amphitheatre. Um, but it today usually gets referred to erroneously as the Colosseum. In fact, the Colossus, after which uh, um, it, it has been erroneously named, uh, was a huge statue. That's what Colossus means, as in Colossus of Rhodes, you know, wonder of the world, ever so big. Um, there was a huge statue of Nero, uh, well, I say of Nero, originally of Nero, but of course various megalomaniacs uh, decapitated the statue and replaced its head with their own, uh, not their own actually, a, a very large sculpture of their own head. They didn't put the, that would be weird. Um, and uh, so anyway, so it's erroneously called the Colosseum. It was the, uh, the Flavian Amphitheatre, and this was a purpose-built uh, uh, building for holding uh, the gladiatorial displays in. And so you can see that by the time something this enormous gets built in the centre of Rome, this is big business. I mean, that's an extremely expensive building to uh, construct, so you're going to have to generate an awful lot of income to get your money back on an investment like that. Now. Uh, so it started off in marketplaces and tombs and then went to the arenas and the arenas were wooden and then they became the big stone amphitheatres. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the amphitheatre of Flavius could hold comfortably 50,000 people. That's about the same number as today uh, fits into St James Park, the football uh, ground where Newcastle United plays. Um, and uh, at Wembley is about 90,000, uh, so Wembley is bigger, but actually you could, at a pinch, maybe get 80,000 uh, into the Flavian Amphitheatre. So not much fewer than even today's uh, national stadium in Britain. Although to take this in context, uh, in the Circus Maximus, where the horse racing happened uh, in Rome, you could fit 150,000. Yeah. Uh, sport was big in Roman times and it happened on a scale that rivals uh, modernity uh, quite impressively. Um, so, uh, oh, and how do they uh, uh, pay for the, uh, the, the massive Colosseum? Not the Colosseum, it's the Flavian Amphitheatre. Flavian Amphitheatre. Uh, well, apparently um, uh, the Jews revolted in Judea and after that war, and they, they put that down, they looted so much uh, loot off the Jews they were able to pay for the um, Flavian Amphitheatre. Uh, anyway, um, gladiatorial combat was getting pretty big. By 174 uh, BC, uh, you, you, there was a, an event with uh, 74 gladiators over three days. Although that's only that's still only 12 fights a day, so that's not that's not a huge number of fights a day. 12 fights a day doesn't sound so so huge, does it? But 74 gladiators over th you know, a three-day event that makes it sound really big. So clearly they were, uh, they were taking their time and there were other things to see. There would be an awful lot of other sideshows. Uh, they, they would be drawing it out a bit. Um, now, uh, 
At first, it was often referred to as a munus. That is to say, it was a duty. That's what the word means. A duty, an obligation, if you like. There was a duty uh, to entertain the public. Uh, so if you were um, a, a rich person in Rome, particularly one who wanted uh, a particular public office, then you had a duty to entertain the masses. It was, it was something that you were expected to, to put on quite often out of your own pocket because an awful lot of uh, policies put forward by uh, Roman politicians, pe those same uh, Roman politicians were expected to pay for. If you say, I think we should have lots of uh, really good drains in the centre of Rome, elect me and I'll see that those drains happen uh, and I will pay for them. Eek. But uh, the, the top politicians in Rome were very very rich, so much richer than, than the people are today, comparatively. Um, so um, you could put on the uh, put on the games as a promise to the people, uh, elect me and, and you will get some really, really good games. And of course, this was a promise that you had to deliver on. Um, later on, things became controlled more and more by the state and they became state funded. And they were state funded gladiatorial games. But in the early days, they were uh, private and What's more, they could be private. Any private individual could own and train gladiators. But later on, when the state started tra taking over, uh, you needed the right permits to, to own and train gladiators. Uh, but with the right connections, you could get those permits. Um, now, if you wanted a certain office, you might be required to put up perhaps two thirds of the cost of a gladiatorial contest. contest. Um, but in other words, it's like the price of entry. You want this job? Okay, it'll cost you this and the money goes to the games. But actually what they're doing is they're keeping poor people out of the job. You can see how this was the, the, the way the system worked. And you put on good games and you might get re-elected. Um, now in uh, 65 BC, a certain edil or idile, there are various ways of saying it, um, uh, called Julius Caesar. He was an up and coming type and he was quite a showman and he was fearsomely rich. I mean, just wow, was he rich. Uh, he decided to uh, expand a bit, do things a bit more, um, a bit more of a, a, uh, an impressive scale. And so he, he had 320 gladiators, an un absolutely unprecedented 320 gladiators. And he had them in silver plated armor because why not? Um, and he knew how to put on a show and impress the masses. And uh, apparently he was the first person uh, to have teams of gladiators fighting each other, not just duels all the time. But then again, he had 320 gladiators to make use of. Um, so, uh, oh, and uh, this was a problem, of course, because 320 gladiators, you personally, in Rome, in actual Rome, you've got 320 highly trained very loyal armed guys. Now you've got a little private army. They actually got a bit scared and said, okay, 320, uh, that's now the maximum. You can no more than 320. Mark Antony, a contemporary of uh, Julius Caesar, was going around with a, a bodyguard of um, gladiators. And I dare say they were a pretty impressive sight. So, oh really, you, you want to mess with me? Do you? Do you really? Uh, perhaps my bodyguard will have something to say about that. And you could imagine that some of these uh, gladiators might be pretty darn loyal, more loyal than perhaps uh, soldiers or uh, other armed men might be, because technically a gladiator is a slave and technically uh, you therefore have the power of life and death over that person directly. I mean, it, that person would be your property to kill. If you want to kill that slave, you can, that would be legal. But also um, you could put him into the arena against somebody stood in almost no chance against. You, you could indirectly kill him. So when someone's got the power of life and death over you like that, you might be you know, really, really attentive to his wishes. Um, now, um, there were things called sumptuary laws. Now, a sumptuary law is a law which limits how much uh, extravagant expenditure people can go in for. Now, sometimes in certain places and periods, these sumptuary laws were very, very specific. In medieval England, for instance, in the 14th century, um, there were very specific sumptuary laws about who could wear what type of fur and how much. So these people couldn't wear these furs at all, uh, but maybe they could wear that type of fur, but only as a trimming on the collar and not the whole coat or, or whatever. And there was, it was all very, very set down, very prescribed. And so you could tell someone's rank very accurately by the fur on their coat. Um, and uh, there were sumptuary laws brought in in Roman times to limit the spiraling costs of these gladiatorial displays. 
Um, but it seems that they didn't really work. Sometimes they worked a bit, but they got ignored again and again and again, including by, by emperors. Um, so, for instance, uh, Trajan in 108 to 109 uh, AD, uh, he decided to put on 123 days of games involving 10,000 gladiators and 11,000 beasts. Yeah! Um, so you imagine that uh, he was probably not really paying all that much attention to the sumptuary laws limiting. Uh, certainly uh, uh, 10,000 is an awful lot more than 320. Um, but uh, if you think that uh, if you divide that number of people by those number of days, you're still only getting about 40 fights a day, assuming they're du and that's assuming they're all duels. So um, as soon as you start doing the maths, you realize, oh, okay, it's not uh, perhaps as amazingly spectacular, but still, 123 days of games, and these were these were largely all day events in in a, in a circus, and the lots of and with thousands of people watching. So an awful lot of people are not doing work. They're not baking bread or whatever they else will, will be doing. But yeah, there's an awful lot of man hours of Rome put into putting on spectacles of gore for them. Uh, Commodus, uh, you might know Commodus uh, as this guy. He's the, the baddie in the film Gladiator. Uh, actually, okay, he was a very bad baddie in uh, you know, evil baddie in the uh, in the film Gladiator. But the actual Commodus was you know, possibly worse. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the uh, in the film, he appears in the gladiatorial ring, and he did. Although uh, he used to use a wooden sword and he made sure that he pretty much invariably won. And he absolutely ignored all the sumptuary laws. He put on stupendously expensive uh, extravagant events. And of course at their height um, uh, the, the editors, um, an editor, that's actually a Latin word, the editor is like the impresario putting on the show of uh, a gladiatorial uh, dis uh, contest. So he would be the guy who decided what event is on first, who's on, uh, which event, nearly said who's on second. Um, the order of events, he's, he's the guy, he's the impresario who's putting the show, he's hiring the people, um, saying what sets will be built and, and so forth and deciding what, yeah, all that. He's, he's the guy who puts the program together. So the editor, uh, the, the editors were, were, were flooding uh, some arenas and putting on sea battles. And of course they wouldn't be duels, they would have involved very large numbers of men all fighting at once. Though I suspect probably um, not using sharp weapons. Um, Anyway, and, and Commodus, uh, he went to wild excesses, uh, and a lot of it was for self-aggrandizement. Now, um, one thing that they did as part of the games uh, was, was hunting. Um, a gladiator was different uh, from a, a venator. The venatores were, were hunters, and they did acts with animals. Some of them uh, a bit like circus um, tricks, like they got elephants to walk the tightrope or putting a, an arm in a lion's mouth and not getting it bitten off, that sort of thing. But they would also hunt animals for the entertainment of the masses. And uh, Commodus is known to have killed 100 lions in a day. Um, and you might think at first that's really impressive, but horrible. I mean, today we wouldn't want to watch someone killing lions. Um, but I think actually, even with a Roman mindset, it was still not great. Uh, it's thought that uh, he had a, a tall platform built in the arena and he stood at the top of it with a bow and an awful lot of arrows and uh, shot lions one after the, the other. Um, now, if you're in the audience for that. At first you might think, wow, a hundred lions. And they, they opened the, actually, I don't actually know if they all came in at once or it was one at a time. I don't know. But let's imagine, for the sake of argument, it was all at once. They opened the gates and a hundred lions come in. You go, wow, a hundred lions. Look at them. Maybe you've never seen a lion before. Wow, incredible, fabulous beasts. They're just like the statue, only, only they're moving and, and they're, they're huge. And wow, look at the teeth and the claws on them. <gasps> so some of them are fighting already. Oh, look, some of them run over there. And you're just looking at them. The spectacle of a hundred lions would be amazing. And then Commodus, the emperor, comes up and uh, gets out a bow. And oh, is he, is he going gonna to shoot some? Oh, wow. He could shoot into the audience from there. But okay, he's shooting down into the arena and and, oh, we nearly got one. Oh, look at them. Look at them all running around. Oh, look at that one. Oh, did you see the one? Did that one jump? Did you see the one? Yeah, I said, wow, what did they jump on it? And wow, the noises they're making and the smell. Wow. Um, and then he shoots one. Oh, look, it's wounded. Oh, look at how the others are reacting. And this will be an amazing spectacle. And then he shoots it again and maybe it falls down and he starts dying. And, and then he shoots another one. 
and then he shoots another one and another one and after a while he's shot 30 lions and you're thinking is he going to shoot them all is that it is he going to shoot them all i mean we could have had we could have had a hundred contests between a bestiarius, uh, someone who, who's trained specifically to, to fight beasts like this. Um, and, and we could have seen some of our favourite guys put their lives in danger down in the ring, fighting these, these, these magnificent beasts. And you're just, for your own self-aggrandizement, just shooting them all. And uh, then you've shot 70 of them. And now there are, there are 30 lions cowering in a corner who don't know what to do. And now you're going to shoot those as well. It's not actually a great way to make yourself popular. Even with a Roman mindset, that was just horrible. Uh, and um, there were various stunts, like fighting a whale, uh, one of the emperors did, that um, won them few friends, actually. Um, now, if you wanted to put on a gladiatorial show, you needed to go to see the Lannister. Uh, now, the Lannister was a very was not a respect a respectable man they, they these were they were not guys who who rubbed shoulders with the highest in society they were considered like like pimps um the lannister was the guy who ran a school and if you wanted to hire some of his uh, gladiators from the gladiator school you would have to speak to him and uh, he'd he'd fix you the price and i imagine that sometimes negotiating with the lannister was quite tricky and now if you were an owner of a gladiator school that's different Oh, that's fine. Um, you could be very respectable. A lot of the, uh, the, the highest and most uh, rich and respected people in Rome owned gladiator schools, owned loads of uh, gladiators. But the Lannister, yeah, he was, he was the, the pimp. Um, you'd imagine if, uh, in the 1930s he'd been wearing a very sharp suit, a very sharp pinstripe suit. You know, that sort. Yeah, yeah, of course it'll cost you. I could do that. So you would go to him and uh, you, would, uh, you would say, Right, uh, I want uh, so many of this kind of um, uh, act, I want so many of that kind of, uh, I want so many secutors, so many um, myrmidons, I want so many retiari, and so forth, all the various types of uh, gladiator, and, I and, and you would strike a deal with him. Um, at its height, in Rome, there were four, uh, at the height of the gladiatorial period, I mean, um, uh, there were four gladiator schools just in Rome. Uh, these are separate from the schools for the bestiarii. The bestiarii are the men who fight uh, animals. Uh, and that, that includes the, the venatores, the, the, the hunters. Um, so that they're a separate lot. I'm just talking about gladiators. Um, and the biggest of them had about 2,000 gladiators in it. Uh, oh yeah, so you, back in days, remember how people were shocked that, uh, that Julius Caesar had 320 gladiators? Well, he was one school in Rome with 2,000 in it. So yes, the scale went up and up. Uh, things got pretty grand. Um, now, you might now be asking yourself, yeah, but who were these guys? Who on earth would want to become a gladiator? Oh, when, of course, they were all condemned men, weren't they? You, you were sent to the games as a punishment. Yes. Well, actually, there were three sources of um, uh, recruiting uh, gladiators. Uh, some of them were, particularly in the earlier days, uh, prisoners of war. So you've uh, fought a war somewhere, taken loads of prisoners, and of course a lot of them will be uh, fit, healthy men of fighting age and perhaps pretty uh, well trained in, in martial skills, and so they would make good gladiators, and so maybe you could persuade a gladiator school to buy a load of them. So that's one way that the gladiator school might acquire. You might buy uh, a load of prisoners of war. But you wouldn't want just anyone. Not all prisoners of war would be dumped on gladiator schools. You'd only want the guys who'd make very good gladiators. Uh, others might be sold for a better price because of some other skill they've got. Maybe they're very good weavers or potters or something. Um, so that was one, uh, one source. And of course that meant that, uh, particularly in, in those early days, you'd get a lot of people from Gaul, from, uh, from Thrace, and uh, from, uh, from uh, amongst the Samnites, and uh, there, this explains why early types of gladiator tended to be a national stereotype and they would be costumed in some rough parody of, of uh, that nation's supposed national costume and, and given weapons that were a little bit similar to what those people fought uh, with in war. Um, and uh, then you've also got condemned slaves. Yeah, uh, so if you are some slave who's committed some crime, uh, then you could be sent to the ludi, sent to the games uh, as, a, as a gladiator. That could be a punishment. 
Um, so that was uh, another uh, group that went there. But the third one, the third group is possibly to some of you more surprising, and that is volunteers, people who chose to be gladiators. Well, this was surely you were sent to the games as a punishment and that was it. It was, it was a, a death sentence, wasn't it, for almost everyone? Uh, no, no, not really. An awful lot of people chose to become gladiators. Now, I'd like to be able to tell you with, with authority and, and uh, assuredness just what proportion of them were uh, volunteers. I've seen a documentary on television which said that uh, it was most of them, but up to about three quarters of them were volunteers, but I'm not really convinced that the evidence for that is very good. So I'm going to play it safe and say about half. Um, and, but it could, it, could have been, it could have been most, but what does most mean? Most could be 51%. Uh, but it was an awful lot, regardless whether it's it's half or considerably more, it was an awful lot of gladiators were actually people who had chosen voluntarily to be gladiators. But who the hell would do that? Well, um, poor people, very poor people, for instance, uh, might choose to be gladiators because, well, it's a, a way to get loads of good food, or at least uh, nutritious food, um, free accommodation, free training, free health care, uh, rub downs from a, a, a masseur quite frequently, um, security, uh, a little community that, that, that takes you in, um, and the chance of fame and fortune. And we know that people will do all sorts of things for fame and fortune, don't we? I mean, today, for instance, um, most of the people who become professional boxers are from a fairly poor background. But it's a way, it's a way out of the ghetto, isn't it? It's a way to make fame and fortune. Only very, very few people make it, but it's still enough to tempt a, a load of people to become boxers. Who on earth would step into a ring with a big, hefty guy who's very good at punching and then be punched in the head repeatedly for round after round with everybody watching? Who would do that? Who would step into the ring with Mike Tyson? Well, turns out quite a few people. If, uh, if you entice them with fame and glory and that sort of thing, uh, then yeah, actually there are quite a few people who will you know, prepare to become a boxer. So there are poor people, uh, that's one lot of people, uh, but there are also um, glory seekers and there are, there are people who are after the money because the prize money, in theory, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the gladiators kept the prize money. I suspect that uh, their, their trainers and schools and, and various others would perhaps take a cut a lot of the time. But uh, there's the money that's prize money. But also, if you fight well in front of the crowd and become popular, they, they throw money at you and you get money from the crowd. So you get you can get a load of money. So there you go. That, that's a good reason. And it can get you out of debt. A lot of people were debtors and you can go to a Lannister um, and negotiate. And you could say, well, how about I agree to go into the ring so many times if you pay off my debt over so many months in return for... You could negotiate with the Lannister, good luck. Um, and uh, so that's another thing. So bankrupts and, and, and debtors, uh, that's another sort of person who would volunteer to become uh, a gladiator. Um, you could also uh, try to win your freedom if you're a slave, um, if you fought really well. Um, you could also seek redemption. Because of this, this noble ritual uh, side of it, you could step into the ring in order to prove something, that you weren't a coward, or to uh, atone for some sin or whatever. So that was something else uh, you could do it for. But another one, which I haven't come across in any of the books, but surely it's women, isn't it? I mean, if you want to impress women, getting, in, getting into, the, uh, into the, the arena and apparently risking your life with a really, really sharp sword against some other guy who's actually quite good with a sword, that's going to impress the ladies. And you're going to be doing it in front of thousands of ladies all at once. One of them will like you. One of them will think you are sweet or cute or brave or something. And we know that this was actually a scandalous problem, that the women of Rome did actually find these, these low-born, awful uh, gladiators that you weren't supposed to uh, respect in that way. They did find them actually really sexy, and there are a number of scandals of sometimes quite high-born uh, ladies running off with um, horrible, ugly, scarred, and goodness, what the hell does she see in him? Gladiators, but ah, oh, they were gladiators, and ah, oh, the heaving bosom. Uh, you know, if you if you want to inspire uh, women to like you, then that's one way. If you haven't had success in other ways, then you know, and and men will do anything for the attention of women. So that's another reason that I put put forward to you that is why someone might become a gladiator. Um, now, if you were sentenced to go to the games, to the to the ludi, 
Um, uh, I talked earlier about munus, uh, meaning the, the, the duty, the obligation. Um, uh, a munus um, uh, gave way over the years to ludi. Ludi just means games. Um, as in the game Ludo, I play, uh, or the word ludicrous. Oh, you know, it's just a game, right? It's just something like in a stage play or whatever. This is ludicrous. So the games, the plays, the shows, um, uh, they, they took over from, from the, the, the duty, the obligation, the memorial games, the, the funeral rites uh, of yesteryear. So after a while, people stopped calling them uh, the munis and they referred to more the ludi. But anyway, it's the same sort of thing. Um, if you were sentenced as a punishment to the ludi, uh, typically they'd be given a, a minimum number of years. Uh, five was common. Uh, so uh, you would have to spend five years fighting in the gladiatorial ring. Well, you're almost certain to die, aren't you? Who could survive five years? Well, actually, look at it another way. Typically, gladiators were fighting two or three bouts per year which is about the same as a modern professional boxer. The overlap between modern professional boxing and, and gladiatorial combat is, is there's a lot of overlap. So they're fighting about the same number of bouts that have the same amount of time to prepare and yeah. be alive, not being in danger. And then they would uh, step into the uh, arena, fight their fight, and assuming they didn't die, it would be quite some while before their next fight and they could train up and they didn't... How would you compare this with one of the main alternatives, which is going into the army. Now, in the army, at the height of the empire, uh, it used to be 10 years you served in the army back in the earlier days of the Republic, but by this stage, serving in the army is 25 years. 25 years in the army. And in the army, you fight battles against large armies of opponents who are all trying really hard, their level best, to kill you. Whereas, five years being a gladiator fighting just one opponent at a time who's just trying to defeat you rather than kill you but granted you, you know putting your life on the line you might step into the boxing ring over a five-year period two or three times a year does that sound better or worse than serving in the roman army for 25 years and having to fight battles when you compare it with joining the army, particularly he's become much more famous as a gladiator, because who knows the eighth soldier from the left in a formation, whatever, but as a gladiator, you're going into the arena as an individual in front of everyone. You become famous and known, and there's a potential for greatness, which is far outstrips anything you'd get in the army, and you have to serve for ages in the army. By the time you get out of the army, you'll be an old man, and yeah, and the enemy, they are all really trying to kill you. So actually, in comparison to joining the army, it's starting to sound quite good, even a, cuffy, even a cushy option. There was actually quite a lot of overlap between the army and gladiator schools. A lot of gladiator schools were immediately next to some army barracks, and, and there was a lot of uh, overlap in, in the, the organisation of the, of, of the two. Um, and some army units sort of owned-ish, or owned stroke ran, the, the gladiator school. It's a fairly obvious association for there to be. Um, now, um, being... A gladiator was, if you look at the whole of Roman society, was low status. Um, oh, they, they've joined the like like boxers. We don't. The most successful boxers are high status in modern society. But your average uh, slugger in the gym, they're not high status guys. Um, and nor are the the guys who run boxing gyms. They're they're, they're not rubbing shoulders with the highest of society all the time. But um, you were, if you like, buying into a different society. There was a camaraderie in it. You, if you perhaps were quite low born and you didn't have great family support and so forth, but you joined a gladiator school, then you're, you're, you're joining this, this world that has its own support groups. They had uh, their own uh, collegia, as they were known, which were the... Uh, um, it's almost like the gladiators' union, if you like. Uh, these little unions where, where the, your fellow uh, gladiators would chip in uh, to see you through hard times, would chip in for your funeral, would make sure that your family was all right if you died, um, that sort of thing. And gladiators, they had their own cemeteries. They weren't buried uh, with the other people. Uh, but maybe that wasn't so much ostracism from mainstream society in a lot of their minds. Maybe it was have joined this society now. Okay, yeah, I got thrown out from that society, but actually I'm happy being in this group now. Yeah, I'm being buried amongst my fellows. I'm living amongst my fellows. I've joined this little society. Maybe other people don't think that much of it, but actually we're fine. 
So that's something that some people might have quite happily bought into and they might have felt comfortable in it. Just like there are some people who spend their lives today in the army and they become sort of institutionalized in the army. The army becomes their family. Well, the same sort of thing could happen with the gladiatorial school. So it offered that to some people. Now, uh, the difference in fate between these people could be enormous. Some of the top, top, top most famous gladiators were given state funerals with all the trimmings. But if you behaved badly in the ring, if you disgraced yourself, if you showed cowardice, if you broke some rule or whatever, you could end up having your body unceremoniously dumped in the countryside. And according to Roman religion of the time, this would mean that your soul would then uh, be set roaming this world ever forlorn because it was never given a proper burial, it never got rest. So yeah, that was a pretty nasty fate. So behave well uh, in the arena and uh, you, can, uh, you should avoid that. Now, uh, in order to join, uh, you would have to, as, as a volunteer that is, uh, you needed a permit. This is after the state has got involved. Uh, you would need a permit from a magistrate and I would imagine that money would change hands for that. And then you would need a medical examination and I imagine that probably cost money as well. You'd have to pass that uh, medical examination. And so you would be, because they're really interested in, in putting on displays of good fighting, um, martial prowess in front of the crowds. They don't want, um, weedy guys who are going to let them down. So they want to make sure that uh, they've got people who are sound in mind and body. So you'd have to pass those two first tests and then you'd have to get someone to take you on and, and join up at one of the schools as a gladiator. Uh, and uh, if you were a, a condemned prisoner, uh, however, sorry, I, I, I realised I've just uh, sort of gone off on a bit of a tangent, but I just remember, if you um, were a condemned prisoner, uh, then it is thought that you would be branded or tattooed somewhere visible, maybe on your face, but don't forget that uh, with Roman men, they, they, uh, if you were tattooed or marked uh, in the lower arm or lower leg, that would normally be naked. So that would be very a public visible place to be branded or tattooed. Um, and so that would show you for the rest of your life, even if you got out of that mess, uh, that would show you for the rest of your life as being a... Uh, a uh, a gladiator, and so it was. This was not a decision to take lightly. Uh, although, of course, if you if you commit the crime and get sent there against your will, well, they shouldn't have done the crime. Anyway, um, and uh, you would then live in cells quite often in the uh, in the gladiatorial school and school, and you would be fed on what some people describe as a vegetarian diet. Um, it was certainly vegetable heavy. But I'm not sure that it was actually vegetarian, which would mean no meat at all. But you, you would uh, be fed a largely vegetarian diet. And uh, one thing that you ate in a lot of uh, quantity was barley. Um, now, the Romans did believe that barley was particularly good at building people up and make them big and strong and so forth. Uh, but it's noticeable that the, in the army, um, you were normally given wheat. But if uh, an army unit misbehaved as a punishment, it could be given barley instead. So in Roman times, barley was not seen as being great food, as enjoyable food or high status food. Um, but these gladiators would be given loads of it and it would, they would they'd grow up big and strong. And um, uh, they, as I say, they would have doctors and uh, masseurs um, looking after them. Uh, Garland, the, uh, the famous Greek uh, doctor who, well, physician, I suppose I should call him, who later became a personal physician to a number of Roman emperors. He actually served part of his apprenticeship as a medic in a gladiator school, although admittedly he was a little bit uh, critical of the uh, medical attention that people were being given there. But never mind. Um, anyway, um, oh, actually, an interesting um, detail is that if a slave were sent to the Ludi as a punishment, one of the things I came across was that there was a law brought in that said that they had to appear actually in the arena within one year of that. And I was just going to be thinking, well, why, why would you need to pass that law? I mean, if, you're, if you've got this guy, you can only make money out of him if you, by, by sticking him in the ring. Uh, just training him up as a gladiator all the time doesn't make you money. It's when he goes into the ring that he starts earning you money. But when I thought, well, maybe, maybe if a, a slave with particular skills commits a crime uh, and then uh, gets sent to the games, he might say, well, do you know what? I'm a really, really good potter, scribe, glass blower, whatever it is. Um, and you could make a fortune just hiring me out doing that as a skill. 
uh, instead of all this training with the yeah. So presumably that wasn't what, what was happening. The people say, oh, I've, I've got this resource now. Someone has given me a skilled slave. Well, I can train him up as a gladiator and he'll probably die first uh, fight because frankly he's a bit rubbish. Uh, or I can just hire him out, subcontract and um, get paid uh, for glass blowing or potting or doing something else that doesn't uh, immediately kill him. Um, Anyway, so they brought in this, this, this law which showed that you had to actually get these guys into the ring and they had to then not disgrace themselves, which meant that you then had to train them up. So I suppose that's why the law was brought in. Uh, anyway, um, one of the reasons that you put on gladiatorial games is to celebrate a victory or to redeem the nation uh, for a defeat. Scipio Africanus, uh, who beat Hannibal at the Battle of Zama, uh, he lost his father and his uncle uh, uh, fighting in Spain. They were killed by forces of King Massinissa of Numidia. Um, and he, in memory of them, put on some games. Um, and this was a morale boosting exercise. That's one of the reasons uh, that they put it on. So he could redeem Rome for the defeats of Cannae and so forth and celebrate victories, uh, or forthcoming victories at least, to, uh, against Hannibal. I don't think he'd, he'd actually fought the Battle of Zama at this point. So he asked for volunteers and he got loads of his mates. He got a load of very high ranking people volunteering and they weren't even paid uh, to appear in his show. Um, now, how did that happen? High-ranking people weren't supposed to do this because if you are a slave, which you have to be to be um, to put yourself, you see, if you own a slave in, by Roman law, the owner has power of life and death over you. He can, if you are his property, and if he wants to kill you, he can legally you belong to him. So, if you technically are a slave by becoming a gladiator, you're you're putting someone's you're giving someone else the power of life and death over you. Your, your trainer, the editor of the show, could actually decide to have you executed. Um, and presumably there were all sorts of safeguards against this happening and people get around these rules a bit. But it's quite a big step to take, isn't it? To say, oh yeah, I'm going to put myself in the, in the hands of the people running this show and I will take an oath as a gladiator uh, to abide by the decisions of the, the officials put over me. Eek. And yet he got high status people uh, appearing in his show. Well, normally the people who get to play um, top flight Premier League football um, uh, are the only people who get to play in the big stadia. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you get a lot of comedians and politicians who will appear for just one match as a sort of, you know, a charity fundraiser do or whatever, a memorial. And uh, it seems that in that spirit he got a load of his mates to uh, take part in the gladiatorial games, presumably not expecting to die. Um, and uh, there was their chance to have a go in the limelight, to be seen in front of uh, the, 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 the big roaring crowds and to, and to show off their skills that they'd got. Yeah, they, they took part as gladiators and as volunteers. Now, um, uh, if you... Um, If you are a slave, you can't buy property, you can't vote, you can't make a will. You're actually a slave. Even someone of, of senatorial rank would have to take that oath. Um, and uh, this was becoming a bit of a problem. Uh, uh, Augustus did actually try to ban Equites uh, uh, signing on as gladiators, uh, but later he repealed his ban. Uh, because it wasn't working. Loads of these equites, that's a knight rank, sort of cavalry rank uh, sectors of society, fairly well off guys, um, uh, they were having a go anyway and, and he repealed it because it, it was making him look bad. If, if you've got a law that bans people doing a thing and loads of people are doing the thing anyway, um, you just look weak, so just, okay, I'll repeal the law. Yes, yes, make it look like a magnanimous gesture, but actually you're probably a bit frustrated that no one obeyed your flipping law. Um, uh, anyway, um, so gladiators were sort of low status, but also sort of venerated at the same time. It's strange that the Romans were fascinated by them. A bit, again, professional boxers. You know, what do people think of the top, top, top boxers? Do they think that they're erudite and educated and, and so forth? No, but there's, there's, there's glamour there, isn't there? The top boxers, they, they get on the chat shows and and the like. They get invited to the VIP events. Um, now uh, uh, Cicero, uh, he didn't uh, think all that much of 
of gladiators. The word gladiator was an insult, and, and some, some words like Samnite, for instance, they were particularly harsh insults. Um, and uh, so he saw them as quite lowly, but he was also fascinated by, by them. And even highborn people had images of gladiators in their homes. So that they, they, they had an interest in it, that the, perhaps the ritual side of it was part of it. And uh, he ended up, Cicero, dying like a gladiator. When, um, you might have seen this scene in, in, the, in Rome, in the television series Rome, when people came to kill him, uh, he took it like a gladiator. He exposed his neck and they dispatched him. Um, and that was the, the honourable way to go as a gladiator. And you could redeem yourself by dying well as a gladiator. And that's the way uh, Cicero went. Now, um, the Damnatii. The Damnatii, uh, as the name uh, suggests, were the people who had been damned. They had been sent specifically to die in the arena. Um, and not all of them did. Some some survived, but not very many, I imagine. Um, they were sent there to be executed, but, you know, you may as well make an entertainment out of it. So whilst they were killing the Damnatii, they would perhaps dress them up in mythological costumes representing um, characters who suffered horrendous fates in mythology. And, oh, let's reenact the death of, of oh, I don't know, um, Icarus or someone. Um, yeah, oh, he fell off that tower and, oh, no, oh, now he's been eaten by, etc. Swallowed by, burnt, whatever. Lots of entertaining ways to kill people are those with the damnati. But even they sometimes would, would somehow find a way to survive, get away, win the uh, approval of the crowd and be spared. And wouldn't that be a wonderful moment that everyone could share in and, uh, and, and, and so forth. It's, it's drama. Um, uh, Scipio... Um, when he captured Roman deserters at the, after the Battle of Zama, at the end of the uh, Second Punic War, the Roman deserters, he just crucified them all. <coughs> yeah, he was um, pretty thorough there. He was, he, was, he was a pretty harsh guy, Scipio. But uh, the foreign uh, deserters, the, the, the foreign traitors, um, the, the, the non-Roman ally, they were supposed to be allied to Rome, but they'd gone over to, uh, to Hannibal, uh, people like the Samnites. Um, yeah, he sent them to the games. Why waste them? Um, now, as I was saying, the earliest uh, gladiators were called Gauls and Thracians and Samnites and so forth, uh, aping these national groupings. Um, but after a while, all these areas came, well, not all of them, but a lot of these areas came into uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, the Samnites, after a while, were part of the Roman Empire. Gaul, of course, became part of the Roman Empire. So uh, you can imagine at some point, a conversation like this happened. And, oh, oh. I can't believe you just said that. Well, I just, just said that, that um, uh, Samnite over there. Oh, I got, I, you, just, oh, you just said it twice. You dinosaur. You absolute dinosaur. I mean, I say dinosaur, even though being Roman, of course, I don't really know what dinosaur means because the science of paleontology is, uh, well, it's hardly got going at all. But nonetheless, you dinosaur. Nobody says Samnite anymore. Don't you realise that, you know, that there's, a, there's a history behind that word? That word has been used with lots of very negative connotations in the past. It's really quite insulting and very offensive. And frankly, I'm amazed to hear you say it. Well, I was just referring to that gladiator over there, and I can, I can see he is a Samnite. No, he's not. Well, I, I don't actually know where he's from, but that's not the point. You don't use the word because, of course, we live now in a multicultural society, and there are a lot of Samnites who are now respectable um, uh, Roman citizens. And, and you know, it, it, it's incredibly insulting to these uh, to, to, to these uh, brave gladiators to use terms like that. Right, so you're, you're okay that we force them to fight each other to death in the arena for our entertainment? Well, yes, obviously. I mean, I'm politically correct, but I'm not political correctness gone mad. Yes, I'm fine with our forcing these people to fight each other to death for our entertainment. But there's no point in heaping an insult like, like, like that on them as well, because that could be very upsetting. I feel that your values are not the same as mine. Now, I'm not saying that that a conversation in its exactitude ever happened, but uh, others like it apparently did. Um, so uh, the, uh, the Samnites became renamed Secutors, and the, uh, the Gauls, uh, they became Mermelos and so forth. So uh, as these nations, um, it became a bit embarrassing that we're, we're, we were celebrating these, we're making these guys fight each other. It, well, you can see the reason, you can see the reason. Um, so that was one change that happened. Uh, and um, 
later on they were adding in more fantasy types and uh, perhaps the chief among these was the Retiarius. Uh, he's the guy uh, like one of these. He's got the, the trident and the net and noteworthy is that he didn't have a helmet and it is thought that these were lower status in some way than other gladiators. Although I don't know why someone would end up being one type of gladiator rather than another. It seems that um, if you were a Retiarius you would very often stay a Retiarius. That would be your thing. Um, so if it's lower status why would you ch choose that one or be given that particular role? I don't know. But anyway, so the Retiaris, nobody actually fights in war with a net and a trident. A trident is a silly weapon. Um, and uh, But the Retiarius was quite, it was, it was quite a formidable opponent because not only has he got the net to catch you in and the trident, but he's also got very significantly a knife. Big difference because if he just had the trident and the net um, you could rush at him, knock his trident aside with your shield and get right up to him and stab 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 even if you bring the net up you can stab him through the net and stab 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 but yeah if you get really close to him he's got a knife and knives are really faster really fast perhaps faster than your sword actually and you might he might stab you to death so maybe you don't want to close with a retiarius but if you hang back of course then his uh, trident and net start becoming rather effective. The Secutor, uh, later designs of Secutor helmet uh, were very like this, very sort of smooth and apparently designed uh, to avoid being caught in the net of the Retiarius. Um, anyway, um, and uh, I think with the Retiarius, whereas in the early days they would have very symmetrical pairings, then when you bring in the Retiarius he's generally not pitted against another Retiarius. So you now have asymmetrical pairings of gladiators coming in and then group fights and then later they brought in equites, they brought in cavalrymen and, and then chariots and then with the wild excesses of the of the, the peak of the period even naval warfare and all the rest. Uh, so there were more novelty acts. Now I know that I'm going to be asked about the gladiatrix. Do these exist? Well the word gladiatrix is modern. Uh, that wasn't used back in the day but it describes something that did actually exist. We do know that there were women gladiators but nobody can tell you how rare they were. We know they were rare but were they exceedingly rare or just quite rare? Uh, we just don't know. Uh, there is literary, literary evidence to show that um, there were quite definitely novelty acts um, uh, and it does seem that a lot of people were fairly unimpressed by them, even a little scandalised by them. Uh, they were never mainstream, so yes, they did exist, uh, but they were rare to very rare. Uh, and that's about all I can say really about uh, the gladiate tricks. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so how did it all happen? Well, uh, the night before you'd be uh, due to go on, you would be given your last meal. This is a uh, similar perhaps to the, the last meal of the condemned man um, as it, on, on death row or wherever uh, and it seems that sometimes this was public. I mean, it was just another way to, to make money. Perhaps you could sell tickets uh, to people because people love to come and gawp don't they and watching a man eating his last meal was apparently something that some people wanted to see um, and I imagine that some people some people uh, eating their last meal might want to be seen as well. It's their time to say their bit perhaps uh, say farewell to some people who, who knew that person who'd come along to say farewell. Um, so there was that little ritual of the last meal the day before and then on the day there'd be the entry procession and uh, in would march the lictors. The lictors were uh, hefty guys with, with uh, fascia, fasciae. They were um, bundles of sticks representing the, the unity of, of Rome through, through the strength of many. You see you can't break a bundle of sticks whereas you could break one stick. Okay and they also had axes in them and these would represent the power of life and death and so they would come at the front and then you would have at the, uh, -da 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 -da, yes trumpeters and you would have guys with palm fronds which would be awarded to the victors. You'd be given a palm front to show yep yep you won. A bit like a, a medal around your neck or whatever. There would be scribes who would parade. They would be there to record all the results um, and uh, there would also be uh, gods of course. Well, not, not actual gods but, but effigies of gods uh, would be brought in so they would be overlooking the proceedings and I suppose uh, therefore uh, tacitly showing their approval of what was to come. Yes, yes, I am Zeus and I am, sorry, Jupiter. I am Jupiter and I approve of these games. Um, and uh, then you'd also have the editor, the, the, the guy running the show, the impresario, and uh, he would then show off all the kit 
Um, now, I imagine that what you would probably do with a lot of this kit is show what you will see if you come back tomorrow or the day after. So if you have several days of games, as they often did, um, perhaps you'd put out all the kit and uh, say, uh, and you'll see this tomorrow. Oh, no, sorry. Well, hang on, but you see this stuff today. Oh, come on, it's good stuff. This is what you see today. Um, so use it as an advertise, ad advertisement for what is to come. Um, and of course, presumably the gladiators as well would, would parade. And I'm guessing, uh, purely a guess here, that they would parade helmets off so that people could see their faces, perhaps carrying their helmets and showing their faces to the crowd so they could be recognised and that would be, you know, their moment. Uh, then, then the games would start and they'd usually start with the beasts. So you'd have uh, fights uh, with animals and uh, then after that you'd have the executions um, and they would be done as I said in all sorts of interesting different ways. And then the highlight of the day, obviously you keep people waiting for the highlight, don't you, would be the gladiatorial contests. That's what, the, the, they were the most um, popular acts. And so people would then watch this skill, this prowess of gladiators pitched man against man. And um, it is thought uh, that because there were live musicians there, and we, and we know this, that there are pictures, for instance, there are, there are mosaics of, of um, gladiators fighting whilst musicians who are there watching them are playing. Because there are live musicians watching them happening, it might be that you actually would have trumpet blasts and cymbal clashes and so forth in time with what's happening. So if, if uh, the trumpeter sees someone go Wah! like that with his sword, he might go Wah! on his uh, trumpet. And uh, if someone is, is whacked on the shield or helmet or something, someone might go Psh! with some symbols. We don't know this for certain, it's conjecture, but it seems that they made use of the fact that there were live musicians there watching things happen to increase the excitement, add incidental music, if you like. Uh, and uh, there would be also, part of the show, extras added in, unexpected stuff. And if you're writing stories about gladiators, yeah, here's, here's a, you know, a dramatic opportunity for you because the editor could throw in another fighter. So maybe uh, these two gladiators fight and this one wah, uh, kill, kills that one. Hooray, I've won, I've won, terrific. And then the editor says, oh, that was very good. Now I'm putting this guy against you as well. You're going to fight a second fight. But I'm really tired after that first fight. Ooh, yeah, well, that's going to be really interesting. But we know you're pretty good because you just won the last fight. This will be interesting, won't it, everyone? <laughs> um, and of course, that way you get two fights with just three gladiators. Whereas if you had two duels that were fair, that would be four gladiators, it would be more expensive. So that's another reason that the editor might pull a, a trick like that. So there would be the unexpected stuff and one of the things that would be unexpected, perhaps, is the expression of free speech. Because in, say, the circus, uh, not the Circus Maximus, the, um, uh, in the Flavian Amphitheatre, 50,000 people. If someone shouts something out, loads of people will hear it, but how many people will know who shouted that? And what if the crowd in general starts murmuring something or roaring something even, approval or disapproval of a particular person's uh, um, entry or, or last act? It's, it's an opportunity for crowds to express approval and disapproval on a large scale. And people could petition the editor. They could say, oh, oh, do this act or have someone say this or whatever. It was a very, very public event. And free, freedom of speech can be a dangerous thing. So that was, that was one uh, use, uh, risk, if you like, of the, if you're a person in authority, um, of, the, uh, of the gladiatorial games. They were a, a gathering, a large gathering of people uh, in an amphitheatre which might be acoustically quite efficient so people can hear what's going on reasonably well. Um, and so you may find that some people are saying things that you might not approve of. And how are you going to stop them? And some emperors got embarrassed in front of their own people uh, that way. Um, now, um, I suppose really I've been rabbiting along all this time. I should say something about my sponsor who has very kindly sponsored me. That's ExpressVPN. What's ExpressVPN? Well, Express means fast, right? And VPN is Virtual Private 
Network. And uh, it's a company that offers um, the services of virtual private networks, uh, which are pretty handy things to do if you're sur uh, to have if you're surfing the internet. Um, now this particular company has over 2,000 servers worldwide and adding to them every week, uh, spread out over 94 different countries around the world, uh, which is pretty handy. Uh, so if you want to, for instance, watch a video which is blocked in your country uh, for some reason, or, or um, uh, read some political news that you can't get access to because uh, someone somewhere has decided that you shouldn't see it being from where you are, well, you can just pretend using this sort of method here. You see, you just, you just pretend to be from somewhere else and your internet uh, messages get routed through that other country and uh, the internet site uh, to which you are applying uh, thinks you're from there instead of where you're really from and so says, oh, it's perfectly fine to show this information to that person and so you can you can get around uh, uh, that inconvenience of the internet um, you could think the internet's meant to be interconnected isn't it you know uh, the interweb the interweb um, internet works best if uh, there are everything connects to everything else and so VPNs actually make the, the internet work more like it's supposed to. Um, another thing you can do is make yourself a lot more secure. Uh, in, in my case this is a, a, I think my principal appeal of using these services. If I'm in an airport or a railway station or something and I do not trust uh, the dodgy possibly insecure uh, local free Wi-Fi, then I can get out of there and route to some secure server somewhere else and then I'll feel a lot better. Um, there are other good things about ExpressVPN. Uh, for instance, they have 24-hour, uh, seven days a week customer support and they are very fast. Um, the, as far as I know, they are the fastest of all the VPN services out there. Uh, and speed, as you'll know when you're surfing the internet, is, is quite important. And the further you, your messages have to route around the world, of course, uh, then uh, the more potential delay of a slow VPN there is. So you want a good, fast uh, VPN. So Express VPN, there's a clue in the name, uh, might be for you. And if you go to www.expressvpn.com stroke Lindy Beige, you'll find that there's an offer. Yes, uh, you can get the first three months free if you sign up for a year, which works out at uh, less than $7 a month. Uh, so it shouldn't break the bank. Um, now, uh, in uh, America, if you're in the USA, your internet service provider, your ISP, can sell on details to advertisers um, it's, it's perfectly legal for them to do that, whereas ExpressVPN will not do that. So if you've, I don't know, bought a sofa and then for the next six months you're seeing nothing but wall-to-wall -wall adverts for sofas on your screen all the flipping time and you're getting quite annoyed because frankly you've just bought a sofa, who in the world is going to buy another sofa? Probably not someone who's just bought a sofa. I mean, just... just oh, it's, it's, that's, that's so stupid, isn't it? But anyway, if that's annoying you, then you'll see less of that sort of stuff if you use the services of ExpressVPN. Now, um, I, a, a, a concerned viewer of mine wrote to me saying, I'm concerned. And I said, well, I, I'm glad that you're concerned. I'm glad that people are concerned for me. What are you concerned about, concerned viewer? And he said, I saw you before advertising uh, ExpressVPN, and I'm really wondering if these services are, are quite everything that you've, you've cracked them up to be. I mean, you talked, for instance, about um, peace of mind. What does that really mean? Are they actually more secure? Well, yes, I agree. There's a problem there because peace of mind isn't actually a thing that, that someone can give you. They can't send you, sell you so many units of peace of mind. You can't pick up a bit of peace of mind. Um, not, not if it's spelled P-E-A-C-E, -E, that is. Um, and uh, peace of mind might not even be to your advantage because you might be in tremendous danger. There are assassins closing in on your house right now. And if you don't get out of there, you're going to die. But you don't know that, so you've got peace of mind. But actually, in your case, having peace of mind is probably to your disadvantage. But having peace of mind in general is a good thing, isn't it? So you'd like to think that you're more secure with a, a VPN. Um, and he talked about the problems of, for example, encryption. Um, and you know, a VPN can be hacked. Well, do you know what? Yeah, yeah. A VPN can be hacked, but it's really difficult. So one of the things you've got to ask yourself is, am I a major government? Am I a multinational bank? Uh, am I someone that's it's really worth large gangs of expert criminals uh, spending a year um, cracking my codes and, and, and breaking my encryptions? Because, yeah, it's, it's possible. There is no complete uncrackable code. 
Um, if you are the hem head of MI6, then what the hell are you doing watching the great long video on YouTube about gladiators? For goodness sake, you're supposed to be keeping this country safe from all the, the, the villains out there. You know, you should be sending out double O whatever, you know, license to thingy. And sorry, I was a bit of an outburst. I'm sorry, M, if you are watching, which I, I, I doubt. Um, uh, I, I, yes, I'm sure you're doing an excellent job, really. But the point is that I really don't think M uh, is relying on the service of a VPN. Think, oh, it's all right, we've signed up to ExpressVPN. Uh, MI6 is, is safe. And I think that if you're running a major multinational bank, then yeah, you want to do a bit more than that. But if you're not one of those, then you're probably not worth the huge amount of effort that people would have to go through uh, to crack the encryption. Um, so perhaps that would give you peace of mind. Uh, but there are the problems with encryption again, because um, if you want to send, say you want to comment on this video, so you want to send to YouTube uh, the text of your little comment to go under this video, well, if you send, send it to YouTube so brilliantly encrypted that YouTube uh, looks at it and goes, no idea what he's trying to say, it's just all, it's all, it's all gobbledygook, well then you won't actually be able to interact. So at some stage it has to be decrypted to then be able to interact with the site. So yes, there are always certain links in the chain. So there is never, there's no service on earth which excuses you from just being sensible. Uh, you have to think, should I be dealing with this website? Uh, they've asked me for an awful lot of details of my information and my credit card number, my date of birth, my shoe size. Should I? Sometimes you've just got to look after yourself. So I'm not going to say to you that if you sign up to ExpressVPN, because I don't know, I'm not an expert. I'm just some bloke who talks about gladiators on YouTube. Um, uh, but you know, I'm not going to say to you that you will be 100% safe uh, if, you, if, if you sign up with a service like ExpressVPN. Now, but... Encryption is better than not encryption. Uh, being able to, and you can choose on uh, ExpressVPN uh, which type of encryption you want. And uh, one of them is uh, some, something called open source encryption, which allows people to, uh, if they find a vulnerability, to patch it. Uh, and this is supposed, uh, has been shown to be uh, a particularly good form of encryption. Um, so, you know, th this, is, this is military grade encryption. How, how good do you want it to be? Um, but the idea that, um, that there's a guarantee is a silly thing. And I, I wouldn't want to try to sell that to anyone. Um, so if you're watching me, some guy who knows things about gladiators and expecting uh, me to be able to assure you that you get 100% security from, from ExpressVPN, well, I'm not gonna give that to you and neither will the company. They won't make that stupid claim. Um, now, it could be that, uh, uh, that they, rather than cracking the code, they just steal the keys somehow. There are guys in jet black skin type uniforms who are really, really good at abseiling who will steal uh, the keys. Well, ExpressVPN changes its keys every hour. So uh, they'll have to be pretty quick off the mark to be able to do a lot in that hour. Um, uh, you are safer by taking precautions than not by taking precautions. That precaution. So there you go. I realize I've rattled on for a rather long time, but when someone wrote to me uh, expressing these concerns about VPNs, I, I was genuinely concerned. I thought, oh God, am I, I hope I'm not selling snake oil here. Uh, there are limitations to what a VPN can do for you. But yeah, if you're on uh, dodgy free Wi-Fi somewhere, if you're trying to get around um, uh, a, a, a firewall, a national firewall or whatever, yeah, they can do that. And they can give you some, I would hope, uh, uh, rational, good, and genuinely useful peace of mind. Okay, so there you go, ExpressVPN. And I do thank the person who wrote in to me uh, because it, it got me to do a lot more research into VPNs. And uh, I, I hope I've given you, you a, a, a reasonable uh, rundown uh, in that, because I, I don't want to oversell something. I want, I want it to be realistic. And I think actually, if you are ExpressVPN listening to me say this, you should actually be glad that I'm being more reasonable about it, um, because I think people will be more trusting of someone who says, you know, let, they, they can't do everything. They won't make you invulnerable. Um, right, okay, so that was uh, my um, sl slightly um, overlong and <laughs> tangential um, sponsorship message. Now, back to Gladiators. Now, the whole reason I'm talking to you about Gladiators is that I had a thought whilst looking through uh, the, um, the websites of modern armourers who make armour today, and one of the things they make, of course, uh, are very uh, pretty uh, Gladiator helmets, like this one, and, for example, this one. And there's something I notice about them, and I thought, that's odd, and that's, that's just wrong. 
gladiator helmets shouldn't be like that. Can you can you can you see what? Well, I'll, I'll get back to that. You see, I think um, possibly gladiators were sort of cheating. Now. When is a sport a real sport? Well, one of the reasons uh, that you might think that a sport is not a real sport is if bookies don't take bets on it. If you can't gamble on the outcome of a sport, it's probably not a real sport. If you want to place bets on whether uh, Big Daddy beats Giant Haystacks in Britain or in America, whether The Rock beats The Undertaker or whatever in one of those uh, choreographed uh, wrestling matches, then no one will take your money because they know that there are people out there who know what the result's going to be because it's scripted. So obviously, unless they're mad, they're not going to take bets on it. Okay, but what can you bet on? Uh, horse racing. Okay, definitely people bet on horse racing, so that must be a real sport. And yet, Dick Francis, a British author, he made his his, his uh, living writing novel after novel after novel about people cheating in horse racing. Almost every way that someone could possibly fix a horse race is in one of Dick Francis's novels. Um, and uh, there have been scandals of cheating in all sorts of sports, in, in, in football, and even, though it pains me as, as, as someone from England to say, I'd, even cricket, there have there have been some accusations and and with reason of of cheating even in cricket. Now uh, we know, don't we, that uh, boxers famously I mean, it's one of the standard plots of a of a film noir is that oh, like um. Uh, Bruce Willis in, in Pulp Fiction, he was he was paid to take a dive in the fifth or whatever it was. He was paid to to um, to cheat. Now boxing matches are different from team sports, aren't they? Because if you want to uh, corrupt a boxing match, you only have to corrupt one person, the boxer. You pay him. No one else need to be in on it. You pay him to take a dive in the fifth and there need be no more conspirators. And if he doesn't take a dive in the fifth, you know exactly who's responsible. Um, so uh, that's one of the reasons that boxing might be perhaps more corruptible than other, other sports. Um, now, there are two ways that a sportsman can cheat. Uh, he can cheat to win or he can cheat to lose. Now, uh, cheating to win, we sort of understand. Uh, this guy is running uh, towards the enemy goal and um, this guy thinks, oh no, he might score. So rather than uh, tackle him properly, he just comes in with a cynical scything tackle and takes him down. It's a yellow card, free kick. Oh dear, that was terrible, terrible play. You know, there are rules against that. That was really cheating in order to win. And yet we sort of understand it. And we sort of at least like and appreciate the fact that he, he really wanted to win. He was trying so hard to win that he, he cheated. But if someone cheats to lose, we hate that. We hate that because that makes a mockery of sport. How dare you? I thought I was watching a real sport. I thought you were trying your hardest and you weren't. It was fake. We hate it when people cheat to lose. Uh, OK, so we don't particularly like it when people cheat to win, but at least we understand that a bit better. Um, now, there were um, there was a study done on sumo wrestling. I read about this in a fascinating book called Freakonomics. Um, someone looked at 32,000 bouts of, 30, uh, of uh, sumo wrestlers in Japan. Now, sumo wrestling is not just a sport, it's also a religious rite. It's part of the Shinto religion. Uh, there, there are priests uh, in, involved and so forth. Um, and so it, it is sacred on a level. And the Japanese world was absolutely shocked when it was revealed um, that there were sumo wrestlers who were actually cheating. Now, uh, he looked at these 32,000 bouts and um, uh, essentially the way it goes is that you, uh, every sumo wrestler in the league fights every other sumo wrestler and uh, you either win or lose your match. And if you, of the 15 bouts, uh, if you win eight, that, so the majority, then your ranking goes up. But if you don't, oh dear. So if you have won seven and lost seven, your next bout is absolutely crucial. This will decide whether you'll go up in the rankings or not. If you have won, say, eight or nine bouts, but lost five or six, then there's no way you can win the overall competition, but you also know that you're going to go up in the rankings. You're, you're safe. So, hmm, 
What if you did a deal with someone who's on 7-7? So you agree to lose. It's not going to cost you anything, but boy, is it worth uh, a lot to the guy who's, who's on 7-7, seven, seven, seven wins and seven losses. Um, and so that's what he did. He looked at the, the, the records of, of sumo bouts go back a very long way. So he looked at 32,000 bouts where you've got someone who was on 7-7 seven, seven up against someone who had nothing to lose by just throwing the match. And uh, how often do you think that the guy who was on 7-7 seven, seven won? Well, uh, statistically, they should have won 48.7% uh, of the time. But actually, it turns out that they won 79.6% of the time, way more often. Um, and with that sample size, you could be pretty flipping certain that something fishy is going on. And you thought, OK, well, let's, let's go further. Let, let's look at what happens with the next bout between those two same guys. And the guy who won last time only won 40% of the time, significantly less than half the time. So it seems that he was saying, OK, right, I won't fight as hard against you next time because you did me that favour with the really crucial match, so I'll make your next match against me not so hard, but I've got to make it look good. So 40% of the time. Interesting. And then after that, it bounces back and goes back to 50% of the time. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Sort of what you'd expect if they were <clears throat> shooting. Um, and this, this uh, as I say, really uh, shocked uh, the, the Japanese, but things that the stakes were really high. Um, if you're one of the top, top, top sumo wrestlers, you earn millions. Um, if you're, say, uh, 40th, you're doing pretty well. You earn a, a decent living. But if you're just 70th best sumo wrestler in Japan, uh, you earn a pittance. You earn about $15,000 a year. Plus, you have to do all sorts of demeaning uh, tasks looking after the more senior, uh, higher ranking sumo wrestlers, uh, cleaning up after them. Um, so, yeah, so the stakes were really, really high. And so it seems that even in the world of sumo wrestling, cheating happens. It's all about gladiators then. Do you think they never cheated at all? How would you cheat? Well, um, did people gamble on the outcome of gladiator matches? Yeah, yeah, they did. Uh, there would be billboards announcing the general uh, what was going to be on in the games uh, to the public. But on the day, you could buy uh, a program that was really detailed and showed you exactly the running order and the named gladiators, all the information you would need if you wanted to place bets on the outcome. And people did. This was a gambling sport. So as soon as you introduce that, you introduce a reason for people to cheat. And whereas it's very difficult to fight better than you're able to fight, you can fight worse. You can deliberately not harm the other guy. So that's one reason that perhaps uh, they cheated. And if sumo wrestlers can cheat, why not gladiators? Um, uh, there would there'll be other things on the billboard as well. Um, we, we, we will sprinkle perfume over the audience. We'll be giving out food. Um, uh, Ten people randomly drawn coming through the doors will be given a door prize. That, that'll be really great. Come, come and see our show. Come and see our show. Um, now, there were... Um, fights that were with wooden, wooden swords. In fact, there were entire games, we believe, uh, that were fought with uh, blunted wooden uh, weapons, safety weapons, if you like, to minimise the amount of death. So this, this notion that the, the general public has that gladiators always fought to the death, it was all about blood and sacrifice and death, is perhaps not terribly accurate. And I look at, uh, in fact, Suetonius, um, he uh, mentions uh, of one of the big gladiator games in Nero's day, um, nobody died. Maybe he was remarking that it was, it was unusual, but he, he talked about one of these big games where nobody died. How is that possible if they're all fighting as hard as they can, trying as hard as they can to kill each other? Well, um, the uh, pictures of gladiators fighting show quite clearly referees, and they're, they're wearing sort of toga-like uh, garbs, which do not look very practical for fighting in. They don't have armour, and they've got a stick. It's a referee's stick for separating uh, the guys. Say, OK, right, back a bit, back a bit, OK, and fight, doing that sort of thing. Uh, with, I suppose you could defend yourself a bit with a stick like that, but um, if you're in serious danger, I don't think you'd be uh, wearing this sort of garb. Um, and yet, uh, they were able to get away with that. So if these two guys are desperate and they think, oh, I'm going to die, they might 
you just lash out at anyone around them. It's as though they're not actually that desperate and that they're seeing it as a sport and they can be perfectly uh, civil in the presence of, of the referee. If these are all condemned men fighting to the death and they know that one of them is definitely going to die and the other one might be hideously wounded, they might try anything. Another thing that would uh, happen was that honoured guests before a bout would come down and we have the, the, the famous do that, do that, do that and in, on he comes and he would say oh, hello everyone and he would inspect the swords and say oh yeah they are very sharp and oh yes yeah, okay and beautiful helmet by the way lovely plumes love it okay so uh, great to meet you I'd be a big fan of your work a big fan of your work so but uh, best great luck to, to, to both of you great fight okay so I who I'm not about to die salute you that wouldn't happen, surely, if these were two desperados who thought, we're probably going to die. We've got to do anything we can to get out of here. <laughs> right, let me out, let me out of here, or the, 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 the local dignitary gets it. Might happen, but it seemed it didn't. It seemed it was much more of a sporting event. Boxers, when they get into a boxing ring, they don't immediately attack the referee or the dignitaries or the announcers or anyone. They don't take hostages because they're not desperate men. They just see it as a sporting competition which they expect to survive. Okay, um, here's another thing. Uh, you could raise a finger. Now, you, 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 uh, you, you, you've heard the expression, uh, oh, those three kids were attacking that one. They were, they were kicking 15 shades of something or other out of them and nobody lifted a finger to help. To lift a finger was to stop the bout. And the referee could lift a finger to stop the bout. But also, uh, we have uh, depictions of um, gladiators doing this. They would, they would raise, a, raise a finger and it was, it was though to say, oh, yeah, right, okay, stop, stop the bout. I think <clears throat> it's a bit like tapping out, if you like. It could just be for a temporal, uh, a temporary thing. Oh, I, you, I'm sorry, that there's, that there's someone in the audience there I think needs needs some help or whatever. But it also, it could be, ah, yeah, okay, he got me. Yeah, he's, he's one, I concede. You've taken a wound, you do that. And in these mosaics, it tends to be a guy who's got a wound, quite obvious, gushing, bleeding wound, who's doing that. Well, why would you do that? Because you expected to live. You expected to be given quarter. No one is going to stop the bout if he thinks that that means I've lost, therefore I'm going to be killed. So they expected to live. If you tap out you in a, in a, a mixed martial arts match, cage fighting, you expect the other guy to then let you go. OK, you've lost the match, but you expect to live, right? No one is going to raise a finger if he expects to die. He's going to carry on fighting desperately to the very, very last. So the fact that that convention exists suggests that they expected to live, and if you'd taken, if you'd fought well and taken a wound and shown everyone, look, they, you know, I, I, I really can't carry on. I've got this wound. People say, oh, that's fair enough, and the crowd would let you live if you had fought well. It was only if you had displeased the crowd or displeased the editor that you might uh, uh, be ruled as um, not having done your bit and had disgraced uh, the gladiatorial arena, and therefore would have to be put to death. And what's more, they did advertise particular fights as being to the death. Why would they do that? Why would you say this bout is to the death if they're all to the death? So they presumably weren't all to the death. So in a fight to the death, whoever loses will die. But in another fight, it's until one guy has been established as the winner and the other guy then doesn't have to be killed. He can, though he may be wounded, taken out on a stretcher, given medical attention, few months time he'll be maybe fit to fight again. So that's another reason why uh, I think that actually not that many gladiators died. Um, also you had to compensate uh, the gladiator school, the owner of the gladiator, if your gladiator that you had hired died and it could cost 50 times as much to compensate for a dead gladiator as to hire him in the hire him in the first place, fifty times as much. That doesn't make any sense, does it? But it does mean that the people paying for the show have got a very strong vested interest in not many of the performers dying, because it can be very expensive for them if they have to pay fifty times more than they were hoping to have to pay. But why is it fifty times? I mean, if these fights are to the death. And then when two guys meet, one of them will die. So the average uh, fight expectancy is one or two fights for um, a gladiator, or you could say half a fight, uh, being more mathematical about it. So surely it couldn't be worth 50 times. He can't be worth 50 times dead. That doesn't make any sense. What are you compensating for? Well, maybe you're compensating for future earnings. 
But what earnings could there be? Well, if you expect a gladiator to survive many, many fights, then future earnings could be quite substantial, which would actually explain why you have to pay loads more. And if he's at the start of his career, you could imagine that as he gets more famous, has more victories on his belt, is, is more known to the crowd, attracts more people, is more of a... St yeah, then he'll be worth more. Maybe if you fight 30 fights in your career, maybe it's the last five where you really earn big money. And at the start of your career then, maybe you could hire this guy quite cheaply, but yeah, if he dies, what you're, you're, you're compensating the gladiator school for is that that future loss of earnings, you were expecting him to last a long time, we had big hopes for him, and we were hoping to clean up in those last fights, and we don't get any of that money, you owe us big time, 50 times you have to pay if he dies. That makes sense. By the way, that's, that's purely my conjecture. I haven't read that in any book, but that's just me thinking about 50 times? How could you, how could you explain that? How could you, how could you say that, 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 that it could be a reasonable amount to pay? Ah, all right, under those circumstances, maybe. Now, um, Caligula and Claudius uh, both managed to make themselves unpopular with the crowds um, by condemning to death some defeated but popular uh, um, gladiators, which again, it fits with what I'm saying, doesn't it? People wanted to see these guys over and over again. They didn't want them wasted by being killed. Yeah, so the guy had been defeated, but he'd fought well. And he, we, we like him, we want to see him again, and ah, oh, you've killed him? Boo! The crowd would boo their own emperor. Um, uh, Augustus actually tried to ban fights to the death completely, and I don't think that went terribly well. I think that was about as uh, useful as his uh, ban on the, <clears throat> the equites. Um, now, oh, yes, somebody, someone's bound to ask about turning of the thumb. Um, sorry, th this business. So, so is that going in for the kill? You condemning a man to death that way or that way? Uh, the phrase is turning of the thumb, uh, so uh, nobody can tell you with absolute authority. Um, and I can see why that looks dramatic, and I can see why uh, some Hollywood uh, movie directors said do that, because down, uh, down death, the underworld, defeat, that general direction looks like bad, doesn't it? So I can see why you might uh, go with that. But then people say, no, actually it was this. Um, if you want my opinion, and here it's complete conjecture from me, I don't know this, but uh, I imagine uh, that when making the decision, the editor, with the, the two uh, gladiators one either side of him, deciding who had won, might do that, because that's a very big, high-profile uh, gesture that the entire crowd can see. So he does that, and then uh, there'll be a, perhaps a big hush, as everyone goes, oh, the decision is coming. And then he would turn the thumb that way, or that way, meaning I reckon he's one, or I reckon he's for the chop, whichever way we're at one. So you'd then indicate by turning the thumb. So there'd be that, I'm about to make a decision, wait for dramatic uh, reasons, and then make a decision. Uh, so that would be my conjecture, but I don't know. I, I'm just guessing. Um, so these uh, gladiators were fighting about two or three bouts per year, which is about the same as a modern uh, boxer fights. Uh, so you, you you get match fit and then you you fight just two or three bouts a year. So you'd have to pay these guys quite a lot. Um, it's very expensive to hire uh, hire a boxer, um, and the, the top boxers very very expensive indeed. Uh, so if you go and I looked this up, if you go to a, a modern boxing match, a you know, big professional fight night uh, today, you will see just two or three boxing matches. Uh, so they don't hire very many. Uh, which means that they have to sort of string it out a bit. To make that a, a full night's entertainment, equivalent to going to the theatre or the cinema or whatever, they've really got to string these fights out a lot. And I think that's what they do. In fact, I strongly suspect that they've worked out uh, from years of experience just how how much you can string it out um, and how much is too much so you don't go that fast. But but so you have all the, the pre-match build-up, all the, all the weigh-ins, all that business. But on the night itself, you've got all the various announcements and people talking about what's to come. And then you announce the, the entry of the, of, the, um, of the gladiator, of the boxer, who then comes in with his entourage and his, his um, shiny uh, satin um, dressing gown on and mock boxing away with fireworks and the and the music playing and on he comes so there's a, there's an introduction and then he comes into the ring that's a second interruption an interrupt introduction um and then he he reveals his fighting body by taking off his dressing gown and that's like a third introduction and 
Then you go through all this for the other guy, and then you introduce them formally in the blue corner, fighting from so and so, weighing this, that, and the other, and you introduce them again. And then you bring them into the center, and you say, "Okay, I want to fight." You're introducing them again. So you've introduced that's about seven introductions. So you're really stringing out, and then. Then they circle each other for a while, and they fight, and then ding, ding, and you have a rest. Someone comes around with a card, and uh, people are then talking tactics about what's going to happen next. And this goes on for round after round after round. Um, and physically, I suspect you couldn't probably string out a heavyweight professional boxing match much longer either. These guys are super fit when they get into the ring. And yet after 12 rounds or whatever, you can see towards the end of the match, they're exhausted. And the, the, the quality of fighting goes down. And if they carried on those fights much longer, then the risk of injury would go up. And it wouldn't be that impressive a spectacle. Uh, watching two guys drunk with exhaustion, uh, feebly trying to hit each other, is not what people have paid money to see. They paid money to see the best, to see the champs. So they probably worked out that's about as long as we can make this match uh, last, physically because of what the athletes are capable of, and also dramatically, because if you spend too long introducing people, then they really will get impatient. Oh, come on, will you start the fight now? So it seems that the same thing is happening with gladiators. Uh, these gladiatorial uh, uh, matches in, in, the, in the arena would go on all day, but they didn't have that many fights. And a lot of the fights, it seems, lasted 10 to 20 minutes. And they would sometimes have, okay, split the and they would have you know, a, a break, like between rounds. Quick rub down, uh, tactics, um, are you all right? Okay, carry on, right, round two, ding, ding. Uh, no, no, not necessarily a ding, ding, but maybe they had trumpeters, blah, 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 round two. And they'd carry on with the fight. So they're really stringing it out. Now let's look at how that they're equipped most of the standard gladiators, something like this. So you've got a big helmet that completely covers your head, you've got a big shield quite often, and you've got uh, one or two greaves covering that, and quite often you've got armour on your, on your sword arm as well. So everything that it's showing is pretty well armoured. So if you stand back and hack at the guy, you're not going to hurt him. He's a competent guy, he can just move his shield around, bonk, 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 and even if you get past his shield, clang off the helmet, clang off, um, off his greave. You're not going to hurt him, you want to kill him. You have to get in there and his torso and thighs, they're largely unarmoured. Um, so you get in there and you go, stab, stabby, stabby, stab, stab. But of course, if you get really close to a guy and you're going stabby, stabby, stab, stab, and it looks like you're trying to kill him, then the most rational thing he can do is try to kill you faster. So even if you do kill him, you're probably going to have a horrible, possibly even a mortal wound at the same time. Hmm. Thing is, though, if I thought you were equipped like this, and I were equipped similarly, and I thought that you absolutely definitely were trying to kill me, and that was your only objective, I would try to kill you as fast as I possibly could. I don't want to get exhausted hacking at you from range. I want to get you kill you while I'm still fresh, because that's my best chance. I will try to make this the shortest fight possible. It might not be a crowd pleaser, but it's the way to keep myself alive most. And yet, these guys equipped like this would fight for ages, but you could really, you could really sell it. You could make it look good. You, um, you could impress the crowd with lots of clashing and maneuvering around and and the like. And perhaps you get a couple of little minor wounds, but you keep going. They'll like that, and you get bits of your shield perhaps chopped away, and they'll quite like that. That's quite impressive, and people like watching things being destroyed, don't they? So it seems that they'll be stringing these fights out. How could you make a fight, a duel, a sword fight between two guys who have largely unarmoured torsos, vital areas, how can you make it last 20 minutes unless you're sort of cooperating with your other half, making it last that long? Now, uh, I, I had a look at um, the careers of Tyson, Amir Khan, various things. Tyson fought 58 fights, Amir Khan was 34, Lennox Lewis 44, uh, Conor McGregor 24. I look at the top MMA fighters, about 30. These are the top guys. The top guys are fighting about 30 fights in a career. And of course, a lot of the lesser guys, far fewer. Um, so how many, how many uh, bouts are the gladiators fighting? Well, um, Gladiators sometimes record uh, their, or had recorded for them, their uh, number of their results, just like a modern boxing results, so many wins, so many draws, so many losses, um, on their headstones. Now, there are, of course, plenty who, who only have a few uh, fights on, on the, uh, listed on the headstone, and there's quite a definite drop-up after, after 10, but there are guys with 150, 
um, 50, 80, 50, right, right the way up to 150 um, bouts. Loads and loads and loads of bouts a lot of these guys have fought. Um, there's the grave of a guy called Flammer that was found in Sicily and he was a gladiator and it says on his uh, tombstone that he fought 34 bouts and um, he won 21 of them, uh, drew nine, lost four. Drew nine, interesting. So those drew nine, so draws were reasonably common and these do get listed. Quite a lot of guys fight to a draw. Really? How is it possible that two guys fight for 20 minutes and neither of them has, has even established themselves as a winner, let alone kill the other guy? Right, four losses. Four losses, so he didn't die, even though he lost four bouts. These guys are not fighting to the death. And we know about this guy, <laughs> that he was freed from slavery four times. He was freed. So he went, having been freed, he went back to being a gladiator at least three times. Why would you do that if you thought you were going to die? If, if, if fighting in the arena were a death sentence, you wouldn't do that. Um, now, uh, there is a stat uh, in a book by um, uh, Hopkirk, is it, and uh, Mary Beard um, about the, the gladi gladiators in the, in the, in the Colosseum, uh, Flavid Amphitheatre, uh, that tentatively estimates that about 8,000 people were killed in the gladiatorial arena every year at its height. And that's the figure I, I mentioned right at the start of this video, you may remember, uh, just about. It was, I know, it was a long time ago. But, um, is that a lot? I mean, I said 8,000 with, that, with that, 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 that emphasis in my voice to make, make you think, wow, that's loads, 8,000, mass carnage, I think I said at one point, something like that. Yeah, but let's, let's think about this again. There were about 400 arenas in which these gladiatorial games happened. So 8,000 divided by 400, it's only 20. All right, so... 20 per arena per year. Now, how many uh, gladiatorial match days of gladiatorial fighting would there be per year? Uh, nobody can say exactly, uh, particularly in the lesser, um, uh, the lesser, more far-flung uh, arenas of the empire, but a fair few. I mean, I, I mentioned Trajan having um, 123 of them in um, about an 18-month period. Uh, the, the state was supposed to only put on about two uh, a year, but uh, loads of other people put on theirs and emperors, no, no one would stop them putting on loads. So there were a lot. So let's, uh, let's be not unreasonable. These are very big buildings. They must have had a hell of, hell of a expensive running costs. You've got to get your money back. You've got to put on a decent number of shows. Let's just say 12 a year. That's not that many. So 20 divided by 20. That's one and two thirds. On average, one and two thirds deaths per day of gladiatorial games. And that's the average. Don't forget, in the lesser far-flung ones, it's probably only duels and so forth happening rather than loads and loads of clashes with large numbers of men all fighting. So you'd imagine then that quite a lot of them, typically there would be no deaths at all. Uh, as I say, in Nero's time, uh, Suetonius says that there was a, there was a major game uh, with no deaths at all. But in a, in a tip of just taking that 8,000, dividing it by 400, you end up with... Hmm, a lot of these would have been no deaths at all, and the average is one and two thirds deaths. But wait, I didn't say gladiator deaths. I said deaths in the arena from all causes, including accidents and including, this is the biggie, including executions. Most of the people who died were being sent in in order to die. They were being executed. They were, they were arsonists. They were child snatchers. Uh, uh, the, what else? There was, yeah, arsonists. Uh, they were traitors. Oh, there were also some of them were tax evaders as well. Um, so yes, you could end up being executed in the arena. But that so that's part of that figure of eight thousand. So if it was on average, so the num the average is less than one gladiator. I couldn't tell you, tell you precisely because for a start, eight hundred is only an estimate. But it looks like the average number of deaths per games of gladiators was less than one. So now, looking at it with that perspective, it doesn't really seem quite that so dangerous, does it? And so we get back to these worrisome helmets. And this is the, the thought which kicked off this whole thing. 
I was looking and looking at them and think, are those really the helmets of a showman, of a performer? Because you can't see the performer's face. That's really odd. If if your local theatre were showing some production with Michael Caine in it, and you went, oh wow, and you bought a ticket and, and you just paid extra to get in the front row and, and Michael Caine is going to be in this, the curtain goes up and there are some various people on stage and they're talking to each other and the characters, when does Michael Caine come on? When does Michael Caine come on? Because he's really famous. He's the guy I've really paid to, paid to see. And then the door opens and in comes this guy wearing a mask and he has the voice of Michael Caine. Michael Caine's wearing a mask. Oh, this is very odd. I wasn't expecting that entrance, but there you go. There'll be a reason for this. And he keeps the mask on for the whole play and even during the bows. So you never saw him. You paid extra to be in the front row and you never saw his face. This guy, that's what you wanted to see him, you know, in the flesh. And I just saw a mask. You'd want your flipping money back, wouldn't you? And yet gladiators who got famous as individuals wore face obscuring helmets. And what about the showmanship of it? I mean, you can read a face from really quite a distance. If you've watched uh, theatres from, from Up in the Gods or, or watched um, theatre plays uh, or uh, gone to a sporting match, you, you know that you can actually read the expression on a face from quite a long way away and think how much everyone's going to want to see the face of their favourite gladiator as he's facing this other one as they walk together. Oh, I bet he's, you can't see his face. When he gets wounded, does he, did he grimace? Did he not grimace? What's he planning? You can't see the guy's face. You're gonna, really, I want to see the guy's face. That's where the drama is. This is, this is where the drama is. Look, ah, drama, see? And yet these helmets obscure the face and they really obscure the face. I mean, they've gone to some trouble. They have very broad brims, particularly at the front. They're big, shiny, shiny, shiny helmets. So. The sun's beating down on this bronze and zigging off it and these big uh, broad uh, brims at the front uh, which often come round the side like that as well will cast really deep shadows over the face which then is behind a grill as well. You stand no chance from the audience of reading what's on that guy's face. Why would it be so important to obscure a gladiator's face? Because if you look at the helmets that uh, the soldiers are wearing at the time they look like this. They don't obscure the face at all. So uh, is it because, oh, there's safety consideration because, uh, you know, someone might get hurt? Well, yeah, they're gladiators. They're fighting each other. They're supposed to get hurt. That's, no, it's not safety consideration. Oh, maybe you don't want them scarred in the face. Well, why is that not important for soldiers? And besides, a bit of scarring on the face might make a gladiator look more gladiatorial, doesn't it? A bit more, a bit more you know, gnarly and, and intimidating or something. No, I can't see any reason why gladiators would be particularly uh, afraid of getting a, a, a scarring to the face, whereas soldiers, oh, that's all right. Now, if a soldier's practical helmet is a good design for fighting in and staying alive in and being able to see and hear what's going on and, and act and react, well then surely that would be the hel helmet that, that gladiators would wear. But they don't. They wear these specific face obscuring helmets. Okay, so why is that then? Well, how about and here I'm just conjecturing. Nobody can tell uh, you that I'm wrong. Uh, it's entirely up to you. And nobody can tell you that I'm right either. It's entirely up to you. I'm going to put the argument to you and you're going to think, well, maybe that's a good idea, maybe it's not. But how about this? It's to make it easier to cheat. <clears throat> you see, um, you don't really want your gladiator to die, but you want to put on a good show. So what would make that really easy is if the gladiators could communicate with each other, but not such that the audience can see. Well, if nobody can see your lips move and you've got a helmet down like this, then uh, you could talk quietly to the guy right in front of you and you could tell him all sorts of things. So there you are, you're, you're thinking of fighting him and you're making movements like this. And these movements don't mean anything to uh, the general audience. They just think, oh, he's, he's, he's looking for an opening. He's, he's trying to read the other guy's movements. But actually, if you could hear what he was saying, He's saying, OK, I'm, I'm going to with this hand. OK, that guy over there, I'm going to go for that guy there, that guy on my right. OK, and when I count to three, OK, I'm going to lunge for you. I'm going to lunge for you a bit like that. OK, and then I'm going to go for that guy over there. So uh, you then, when I make the lunge for you, you take a step back, giving me room and I'll dive over there. You'll be fine. I'll be fine. It'll be great. OK, one, two, three. Whir! And then you make the move. You can organize this move if you can just talk quietly and nobody can see you conspiring with your immediate opponent. 
Um, you can set up all sorts of pre-arranged signals. A lot of the gladiators who fought in these fights were from the same gladiatorial school. They would have been able to, over months, organise all sorts of really good, convincing-looking routines. Now, you might think, well, surely, surely, though, people would know that it was all faked. Well, it not, I'm not saying it's all 100% faked, but there is, is there not, a, uh, a conspiracy between audience and performer. When uh, fans of The Rock and The Undertaker or Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks and what have you watch those choreographed, um, you might think, very unconvincing wrestling matches, the people that are really into it, they, they suspend their disbeliefs quite willingly. They want it to be real. They believe in these characters and they just go with it. When you go to the cinema, yeah, okay, it's set in the galaxy far, far away, but yeah, you just accept it. You, there are spaceships and, and, and those TIE fighter things, they can actually fly somehow, um, even in an atmosphere, it seems. Anyway, um, so you, you, there is a willing suspension of disbelief. So the crowd wants this all to believe, to, to believe that it's true, and so it sort of will. And you've got months of rehearsal in these gladiator schools. You can make it look really good. And of course, some of it's real, like some of the wounds will be completely real, but you can um, do all sorts of negotiations and set up all sorts of routines with your opponent if nobody can see your face. So there you go. There is my conjecture uh, for why gladiator helmets look like this and not like this. Am I right? You decide.